And this is a bit complex. I don't know if you've seen this. Those who are familiar with ACT would have seen this. I think it can be scary. It doesn't have to be, and it can be very easily simplified to um, three main skills. I guess they pairs of skills. It's easy to say under fluorescent lights. <laughs> but when that shows up, to accept that, it's a lot harder to do than it is to say, that's why these are skills, that's why we practice. Being present, so being able to contact what it is like outside of your body as well as inside of your body right now. So we call it anchor, maybe. A drop anchor, you would have heard that term before. Mm. And do what matters. Know what you're here for and actively take a step. <laughs> this is very important. And I think as a culture, I don't think we look at that a lot. What's important to you? Why are we here? And take a step. Now, a lot of stuff in ACT is simplified and these guys and everything. <laughs> if you want to see things simplified, Russ has a great knack for taking a complex scientific concept and then making it very available to you. Um, any questions? Of, in terms of act case conceptualization, does it make sense what we've traveled through? Contextual science, relational, um, frame theory, and behaviorism. Those are three main pillars in terms of theoretical perspective. And they can be boiled down and I guess as types, we do take um, extensive history. We do try to understand the person's context in terms of their past, in terms of their, their family, social, environmental, and organic factors, of course. And if I had to boil everything down in terms of the core of that, I'll borrow, this is from a functional analytic psychotherapy, which is another contextual approach, it's a way of doing that. CRB1, clinical behavior one, cl clinically relevant behavior one is what really is ruining your price life. What are they doing that is costing their values? Clinically relevant behavior too is what would you think they'd be doing to build a value in life? If you can be clear on those two and then hunt throughout the session for CIP tools, and reinforce the light out of that. Do I make sense when I say reinforce? Where would you say reinforcement on ABC's rests? And it's, it sounds like it makes sense. But I tell you, I like making noise, I like doing music. And I go and um, of two open mics. I get on stage and sing in front of people, and I see a lot of others do as well. And you know what I notice? This is a very confronting experience. This is in a pub. And no one prepared to see you there. You're just a nuisance. <laughs> and you stand up, and it's scary. And I see a lot of people do that, and then get off the stage and punish themselves for it. Stupid idiot. I can't believe I did this. They apologize on sorry. You mean you just you just had courage to get up there and show a part of yourself, and then people punish themselves. So this is a little bit of a different behaviorism to rats pressing food. We have the capacity to create our own consequence. Does that make sense? Mm. In that sense, my wanting to be an active dad is an ample source of consequence. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you just really explain the difference between the CRB1 and CRB2 again? Mm -hmm. What you believe is ruining your client's life? Yeah. It's costing them their life. Could you give me an example of CRB1 in my example of waterphobia? Not being able to play with your son with water. Ruining. That's ruining, my, that's costing me my life. What would be the behavior that's costing me my life? Avoiding the avoidance. Absolutely. In other words, when I left the library because I heard it, that's my CRB1. What would be a CRB2 that would build my life? What would that behavior look like? What could 
of you as a counselor notice in the room that is a CRB2? You came for counseling. You came for counseling. <laughs> Can you imagine how scary that would be for me? Because I was told that probably I will have to, if this works, face water again. And you remember how protective my mind can be. You tell me how to lose it. And also, any time in the room you notice me opening up to discomfort, opening up to distress, you would reinforce that as much as you can. And use our internal. So you need to know what is reinforcing for your client. It doesn't have to be a piece of chocolate. It's chances are it's something inside of them. Did it feel like you just took a step toward being the bad you wanted to be? Oh, that's reinforcing. Did it feel like you just opened up to some of this stuff? That's very powerful. I guess in a way, I think about it this way. If you found five bucks on the floor, you'd pick it up, you go, oh, let's go. Let's take all the ethical issues out of this. <laughs> Check it out, I've got five bucks. Was there anything else? Moving on. Imagine it's a 50. Ooh. I don't look at the phone. Is that, is that 50 bucks? A thousand bucks? I'll be there next morning going. <laughs> <laughs> your reinforcement here is a consequence of this. The more you let your client feel this, the more powerful. The important thing about consequence needs to be immediate. Time is of the essence. That's why. My missing out on that in life is actually not a consequence because it's too long, too far in the future. Mm -hmm. It needs to be immediate. How do we do this? Now we're getting somewhere. I would like to invite you to learn, and there are many approaches to how to do this. I would like us to try one. How many of you are familiar with Dr. Kevin Box Matrix? No. You will about to learn Dr. Kim I'll invite you to experience something. Can I ask everyone to use their senses? Take this room in. And if your mind is anything like mine, it will predict where this is going, why we're doing this, and how this is going to play out. Let your mind do this. And at the same time, use your attention like a torch or a flashback. Not just the sounds. Look around and notice what it feels like to have the reflections, the light reflected off the surfaces in this room to contact your retina. If you're brave enough, notice what it smells like to be here. <laughs> and we're not going to taste anything for hygiene reasons. What was that like? <laughs> Did you have a chance to experience this? We just took this room in using our senses, and I would like to ask you, consider the last time you were at the shops. Coles, Woolies, um, I don't know, can you, can you think of a time? Very good. Can I invite you all to close your eyes and take yourself to that shop? Look around, is it kind of quiet, kind of busy? Quite of busy, would you answer me please? Is it kind of quiet? Very good. Um, can I invite you to notice what you can hear in your mind? Beeping of the registers, maybe? Can you notice um, the radio? With people talking? Yeah, you can. Very good. Can I invite you to notice the temperature in that room? You were at the shops. Was it kind of cold? Kind of warm? Cold. Yeah, very good. And see, most of us will struggle with this one. Can you smell what it was like to be there? Yes. You can. Very good. If you're struggling with that one, you're welcome to position yourself next to the barbecue chickens or the deli with the rotten fish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very good. And I would like you to open your eyes. So here we were, using our senses to experience one environment, and then using our minds to experience another. And I would like to ask you a couple of questions about this. They may be awkward or discomforting. Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. You did one and then another, and I would like to compare. Now, mind you, I'm not interested in comparing this environment to the shops. 
more so, I'm curious to compare what it felt like to use your senses to experience something to what it felt like to use your minds to experience something. Now, don't describe it to me. Can you tell me if it's kind of similar or kind of different using your mind compared to using your senses? Kind of different? There isn't the right or wrong about this. Are you able to notice? Kind of similar? Yeah, very good. A lot more form to um, what's happening around you. It's really and I discourage you from trying to describe this. Focus, yeah. with the imagery, the focusing. Very good. You found how you approached it was very different in terms of focus. Yeah, very good. So, next question I would like to ask you, I, I want your permission because it will kind of trap you in that you want to have an English word to answer me with. Would that be okay? We haven't agreed on one yet. <laughs> Whilst you are busy using your senses here, or later on busy using your mind, what part of you remained available to notice what it's like to do one or the other? It's the same part of you that knows you are thinking right now whilst you're thinking. You're busy being confused, and there's a part of you that knows you're confused. Right? Same part that tells me I've been reading the same line five times. I have no idea what it says. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? We have a part of us that remains available to observe our experience. Culturally, we haven't agreed on the word yet. If you read literature about this, you will read it called um, selfless context, mentalization, mindset, uh, re re related uh, phenomena. You will see it. I like to call it the letter mode. Meta mind, mm. and I've heard it called so many different things. <laughs> I've heard it called conscious, self-conscious, unconscious, metacognition, the brain. I've heard it called. I mean, John kabat himself stood up and called it wisdom 2.0. I mean, we really could just do anything with that. <laughs> um, but the majority of people will call it me noticing, and we clinicians ended up agreeing to call it me noticing. And we have ourselves our first distinction. Uh, the whole matrix rests on two. We have ourselves the first one. There is an outer world that we can contact with our senses, and there is an inner world that we can experience with our minds and bodies. And there's a part of us that can notice what it's like to do one or the other. We call me noticing. Those are very distinct words, worlds. The sensory world is very much bound by space and time. When you were noticing this room, it was only happening here and now. No other place, no other time, unless there's some quantum physicist here, in which case I'd be in trouble. And our inner worlds are very much uh, just incredibly diverse. There is no time or space, or it doesn't. I can right now stand before you. And my mind will go, did you just, did you leave your stove on? <laughs> and my body will respond to something that may or may not have happened. This is, this is our minds, this is our inner worlds. Do you have any questions about this or can I talk about the second distinction? Second distinction. If you are anything like me, you don't like to feel shame. You don't like to feel guilty. Uh, annoyed, frustrated, hurt, you don't like to feel angry, furious, you don't like to stress, worry, feel anxious, panic, you don't like to remember some bad things in your past, feel grief, lost, you don't like to anticipate terrible things in your future, feel rejected, judged, criticized. Notice everything I just named. Perfectly normal experiences. We all have them. And when we ask people, the majority of our very normal and general experiences, people will call unpleasant, unwanted, negative. And we do something to get away from those. <coughs> I might smoke, drink, I might watch TV, I might go to the movies, I might, I don't know, listen to loud music, or go to a concert. I might gamble, or play computer games, I might watch professional athletes play, buy new shirts, or new gadgets, right? I might eat caramel slices, so, um, I don't know. Um, notice, by the way, I don't know if you're noticing each and every industry I just named. I haven't named Facebook, Google, or no work, anything with web. They're doing really well. Do you notice? The amount of money we pay our musicians, our actors, athletes, internet. Do you, are you noticing, as a community, how keen we are 
to get away from our unpleasant internal experiences, to get some relief, we will sink our savings into the other way we will put poisons into our bodies. But we don't even know a bad for us. Right? As a community, we've got key to get away from our internal experiences. And I would like to ask you for an example of something. Consider an example of something you've done in the last three days or so so that we didn't feel a certain way. TV. TV, very good. When? Um, Netflix, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got that. That's it. Um, Thursday night. Thursday night, very good. And away from what? What was the unpleasant internal thing you didn't want to have? I just didn't want to think. I just didn't want to think. Some mindless entertainment. Just so something to do with thoughts. Mm -hmm. Singing. Exercise. What was the unpleasant internal experience? Um, it's just like I just needed to get away from my thoughts. From thoughts. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Exercise can be such a good down. Mm -hmm. That's it's, a, it's, a, it's an endorphin producer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, very good. I Singing. I went from what? Um, to uh, move on from an up the from an end of a relationship. That's painful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't like pain, right? I do some singing too. <laughs> 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 Wonderfully, really. Absolutely, we want relief, and I would like to ask everyone to take a second and think of a time that you moved away in the last three days or so. Away from what? What was it you didn't need to? What does it feel to have a relationship? What does it feel to have the thoughts? And notice, I'm not really noticing what it feels like to be more way Don't describe it, please. It's not a verbal experience. Just notice what it feels like. Like you would notice a landscape or a, or a sunset. You could attach many words to volumes, in fact. They would still not deliver the experience. And I want you to have the experience. You can. Move away. Now we, of course, don't just move away. There's a whole bunch of things we care about. I, um, I don't know, people we love, values we hold, convictions, uh, things that matter to us. I might call my sister and say, honey, I'm so sorry about what I said. Are you okay? I don't have to be bribed or bullied into it. It's not necessarily going to be a fun thing to do. But I might do that because I want to be a caring brother. Or I might not know what I want. I might say, sir, you dropped your keys, without realizing I want to be a uh, helpful community member. <laughs> I don't have to necessarily know. As long as you weren't bribed or bullied into it, you did it because you believed it was the right thing to do. You cared about something, something mattered. Can you think of a move towards you made in the last few days or so? Can I ask everyone to consider something you've done in the last three days or so for no other reason, you weren't bright or bullied. You just did it because you loved someone, cared about something you had yeah, that weekend. Okay, I invite you to notice what that felt like. A move towards something you care about, what did that feel like? Mm -hmm. Don't describe it, just observe it like you would observe the landscape. We can invite you to compare one landscape to another. See if you can compare what it felt like to move towards something you care about, to move away from something you want to Can you notice the differences in the quality of that experience? This is the tool. Notice it's very simple because it only rests on two distinctions. You know, our the world moves away or toward. Now, moves away or toward. I hope you're noticing that the stuff, the thoughts that you spoke of, the loss, is an inexperience. I wouldn't see your stress. Moving away, watching TV happens in the outside world there and then. Same as your value, say for example, of honor or helping clients confront their own barriers, let's call them. 
Now that we can't see. It's an inner experience, whereas your actual being here or picking up the phone and ringing, that happens in the outside world there and then. Stuff we don't like. Stuff we don't like to feel, stuff we do to get away from it, stuff we care about. And notice this is why we're here. We're here because something matters to us. And stuff we do to move toward that. Doesn't have, um, it doesn't. I think one of the mistakes that we uh, sometimes make is we, we think that one is positive, one is negative. It's not true. Moves away don't have to inherently be bad. And if you woke up with a headache today, took a pill, and it enabled you to do a day filled with vitality, things that matter to you, and it actually worked for you to create the kind of life that you want. Where moves away become problematic, from our kind of clinician perspective, is when the more I move away, the more pain it creates. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that this center works with addictions. Is that right? Mm -hmm. huh? Yes. Yes. Very, very uh, simple way of describing describing addiction. I work with addictions as well. Um, I can think of a number of clients who have had a very painful early history, filled with shame, betrayal, mm -hmm. abuse, and they self medicate mm -hmm. I don't want to be in pain either. I can certainly have compassion for this. Mm -hmm. It becomes clinically problematic when the more I try to solve it, the more pain it creates. Mm -hmm. and then I end up mm -hmm. So again, inherently it doesn't have to be a problem unless it holds me back from creating the life I want. I want the living experiences, things I do to control it, what I care about, and what matters. Simple? Maybe a bit too cluttered to make it simple again. Away, away. Now, do you have any questions about this model? Quite simple. It's not actually a question, I guess. I, I really like the idea of, of your uh, discussion of consequences, particularly as I'm coming from the, the gambling uh, work that I've done. And people will say, I need to control myself. And I'll often say to them, well, when you find out how to do that, let me know, because I'm... I we'll make a lot of money together. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I do talk about consequences in the sense, oh, if you're not driving here today, how many of us accelerated towards red lights. Did we need to use self-control to stop at a red light? Yeah. Well, why didn't you drive through red lights? And it is about thinking through the consequences, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so I can see this model would be, I don't know, very Let's useful. Play with the consequences within this model. Yes. Because our human consequences, for the red light, if I felt a rush and one I one and discomfort and kind of mounting tension approaching the red light and I shot through and I got rewarded for it if I felt ah, my consequence is in it I am now more likely to run another red light makes sense? that's a behaviorist perspective and what we're doing here in terms of consequences notice what it felt like to pursue your values that was immediate you can reliably contact the purpose that drives what you're doing on an ongoing basis. You have yourself a source of unlimited internal rewards, consequences. How? I'm going to invite you all to, I invite you to do it for about 15 minutes. So amongst the three of you,